Welcome, everyone. I'm Nicole Lezen, one of the local consultants, along with Nicole Young, who facilitates a countywide initiative called Collective of Results and Evidence-Based, or CORE, Investments, which is itself a collective impact approach to achieving equitable health and well-being for all people across the lifespan in Santa Cruz County. Today's chat is generally about collective impact for those who want to learn more about this approach or refresh what they already know. The content is not directly related to the upcoming RFP, but should be helpful if you're considering an application or if you're not as well. At the end of today's presentation, you'll hear more about upcoming events more directly related to the core RFP, which is likely to be released next week. And as I mentioned, normally our core events are held bilingually in English with Spanish interpretation, but today we'll have to re-record it in Spanish for those who would rather listen that way. But Gisela Carrasco, who's been on previous core coffee chats and is part of our bilingual team, will still translate the comments and questions in the chat. So I'll turn this over now to Nicole Young, who's going to share an overview of core. Do you want Thanks, to do the slides, Nicole, or do you want me to forward them? Uh, I think you'll need to forward them. Okay. So again, the CORE investment stands for Collective of Results and Evidence-Based Investments. And we think of it both as a funding model and a movement to achieve equitable health and well-being in our county using a results-based collective impact approach that's responsive to community needs. So we're really excited about today because we use this phrase a lot, collective impact approach. And so we're going to spend some time really uh, explaining what that means and what that might look like in our community here. And CORE, uh, over the last few years, has really evolved again into a broader movement with this mission and vision at the center uh, that really highlights equity and the uh, goal and shared vision to have an equitable, thriving, resilient community. And when we talk about equitable health and well-being, we use this image of the core conditions for health and well-being as a way to um, kind of ground and anchor that discussion. So really acknowledging that in order to have an equitable, thriving, resilient community, that all people across the lifespan need to have equitable opportunities to experience these eight interconnected core conditions for health and well-being. So we emphasize the connections between them that we, uh, you know, are uh, <laughs> not doing ourselves any favor if we try to approach any one of these aspects of health and well-being uh, as a standalone or a silo that we really have to look at the connection between health and wellness and economic security and mobility and living in a safe and just community. So in our next week's coffee chat, we'll actually focus on uh, you know, defining these core conditions and the connections between them. So we hope you'll join us for that one as well. And when we talk about equity, we mean that uh, we want to reach a place where uh, opportunities and outcomes can't be predicted for better or for worse by things like race, ethnicity, income level, gender identity, sexual orientation, and all those other kind of aspects of social identities. And again, equity, we always put at the center of this diagram to illustrate that we have to examine and address our individual, organizational, and systemic beliefs and practices and structures that often are the very things that are creating and perpetuating the inequities that we're trying to eliminate. And so one of the ways to change beliefs and practices and structures that may be locking in those inequities is to use elements of an approach that's, again, often referred to as collective impact. So core investments, as you heard us say, is a collective impact approach. And so today, we'll, again, we'll take that deeper dive into what that means um, to use a collective impact approach. What are some of the key elements of that? How this relates to core and other local initiatives? And we hope to make this as interactive and engaging as possible. So you're all part of the part of the learning process. And events like today. Uh, and this coffee chat are offered as part of the CORE Institute for Innovation and Impact. And really that just means it's an umbrella for or a container for all types of training, technical assistance, and other learning opportunities for people in nonprofits and public agencies, uh, community groups, and, and sometimes even the business community. So that together we're building that shared knowledge and skills and systems that are needed in order to fulfill 
the core vision and mission. I will turn it back to Nicole now. Thanks, Nicole. And to start us off, just because we're all coming into this Zoom room with different levels of familiarity and experience with collective impact, we just wanted to do a quick poll and ask you these questions about how familiar you are with a collective impact approach. So if you could just see the poll on your screens um, and let us know whether you're not at all familiar, whether you may have heard of collective impact but are still not sure what it means exactly. Maybe you know what it means, but you're not involved in an initiative or collaborative that uses that approach, or you are involved in an initiative or collaborative using a collective impact approach already and are just here to learn more and see how others see it. So, of course, all of these are all well and good. We, we can always learn from looking at collective impact again. Nicole and I, every time we look at the literature on this to update ourselves, find a new dimension of it that applies to the core work and other things we work on. And it is something that benefits from um, multiple looks over time. And as you'll hear in a minute, even the people who came up with this originally have taken a, a closer look recently and adjusted some of the ways that they think about it, which is totally appropriate for something as all-encompassing as this and applied in so many different situations, not just in the United States, but around the world. So we're seeing in the poll results, looks like a few of you still haven't responded, so I'll give you a chance to do that. Oops, sorry, I just ended the poll, Nicole. Oh, no worries. Okay. So it looks like we have representation in a lot of the different categories, but most of you are in either the not at all familiar or the involved in an initiative approach. So this will be great for our discussion purposes, whereas as Nicole mentioned, we can have some conversations with each other about how you all see this. So what is collective impact? 10 years ago in the winter of 2011, John Kenya and Mark Kramer published a paper in the Stanford Social Innovation Review that was based on research they'd been doing as consultants to funders trying to understand cross-sector efforts in education that, in their words, moved the needle on tough, persistent social problems. They coined the term collective impact to describe a type of collaboration that seemed particularly effective across a number of communities that they'd studied, mostly in the Midwest, but they moved on to look at initiatives all over the country. They define collective impact as a type of collaboration that brings people together in a structured way to achieve social change. The highlighted words here point to what sets collective impact apart from the routine collaborations that might be familiar to many of us. And as you can see from the arrows on this slide, the benefit is that different groups and organizations can move from fragmented efforts that may be moving in different directions to efforts that are more aligned and therefore more likely to achieve change. So now we're gonna hear a brief video. It's just a couple minutes long and we'll share the link to this um, later as well. But this is just to get everybody on the same page about just some basic terminology about collective impact. So um, some of you may have seen this before, but if it's new to you, we think it's a really great um, quick wrap up of a complex idea. So here goes. The number and complexity of challenges facing our world can be overwhelming. When individual organizations attempt to tackle the most daunting problems, success stories are all too rare. Many innovative approaches have been tried, too few have worked. However, when organizations work together under the right conditions, they can accomplish great things. One particularly effective means of collaboration is collective impact. Using the collective impact approach, a number of complex social challenges have been addressed and some remarkable results have been achieved. Youth incarcerations dropped by 45% in just three years with no change in public safety, improving the lives of thousands of youths. 6,000 public housing residents were placed in new jobs during the recession. 
More than 1,000 acres were restored and over 280 million pounds of pollution voluntarily reduced to conserve and restore a river. Organizations utilizing a collective impact approach do the following. Agree to a common goal. Agree to track progress in the same way, which allows for continuous improvement. Do what each does best while identifying new ways to work together. Have consistent communication. And finally, have skilled and dedicated resources to support ongoing efforts. The world's toughest challenges aren't going away. In fact, many experts predict they will continue to grow in both number and complexity. Solving these problems requires a range of expertise from a number of diverse organizations. Collective impact is a proven approach, helping organizations work together to move mountains. Oops, there we go. So as mentioned in the video, um, and that's from FSG and the Aspen Institute, which have compiled a lot of the collective impact resources, we'll have a link to their site at the end of our presentation. But as you can see from that, there are five key ingredients to a collective impact approach, and we'll go over these um, in detail as well as some updates of them. So you may remember seeing this slide in previous Cora Coffee chats or conversations. Because these key conditions from the original approach are very relevant to CORE, we often refer to this as the big dream of CORE, that CORE can be a vehicle for going beyond cooperation, coordination, and collaboration, as great as those are, to achieve real collective impact, the lasting improvements and solutions in our community that can only be accomplished through systematic collective actions and investments. Effective collective impact initiatives or efforts have these five conditions which create true alignment and produce powerful results. So they're a common agenda, which is a shared vision for change that includes a common understanding of whatever the problem or need is, and a joint approach to solving it through agreed upon actions. Shared measurement or agreement on the ways that success will be measured and reported at both the community level and organizational level, which helps to maintain alignment, create shared accountability, and use data to continuously learn and improve. Mutually reinforcing activities, which doesn't mean that everyone has to do the same thing. As mentioned in the video, people play to their strengths and do what they do best, but um, that everyone commits to the activities that they excel at in coordination with whatever others are doing. And continuous communication is about the regular communication, meetings, et cetera, that build a common language and most importantly, trust the agreements that are essential for collective action. And a strong backbone is the support that keeps partnerships and the process moving forward. Sometimes it's an organization and sometimes it's shared. It can be performed at least initially by consultants or an incubator group, but there are lots of different ways to fulfill those backbone functions, as we'll discuss in just a moment. So now that a decade has passed since the original article and study were published, hundreds of collective impact initiatives have taken off. A lot has been studied and written about them too. And the authors themselves have reflected on their initial work and identified some areas that need updating, including elements they didn't fully appreciate 10 years ago when they first documented their insights about collective impact. A group at the Tamarack Institute in Canada, including another Mark, Mark Cabage and Liz Weaver, have described what they call Collective Impact 3.0. And it has some suggested upgrades of the five key conditions that we find really compelling. So the key conditions as originally construed still apply, but Collective Impact 3.0 offers some different and we think broader and more inclusive ways of thinking about them. One important insight that the Tamarack Institute team had was that the original Collective Impact work had a sort of management and leadership slant since it was originally work commissioned for funders. This version, the 3.0 version, makes very clear that leadership can take many forms and isn't exclusively the domain of traditional leaders like CEOs and executive directors, 
The Tamarack team calls this movement building. So of course we agree that that's a good direction. It doesn't say that CEOs and executive directors can't be leaders, it just says in addition to. So let's talk about some details of each of the five key conditions and how they're talked about in this 3.0 version. So for, for common agenda, the 3.0 version talks about it as community aspiration. Building on the shift from management of a process to a broader movement for each of the five key conditions, they describe a more inclusive, broad approach that has the added benefit of really focusing attention on systems and structures. So for example, when they call a common agenda a community aspiration, that's more than just different words to us. It gets at the true vision and aspiration in CORE's case of equitable health and well being rather than a checklist or a single data point. And this is also part, another shift is that in the original um, discussions of collective impact, it was usually focused on a single need or problem. And this opens up some possibilities for broader aspirations and things that are linked together. And the common understanding of the problem or need and a joint approach to solving through agreed upon actions is still relevant from the original, but then the 3.0 gives us the opportunity to be more ambitious with a shared vision and outcomes that can't be realized through business as usual. The second key ingredient in the original collective impact approach was shared measurement. And in this one, in the 3.0 version, the Tamarack team talks about strategic learning. So similarly, shared measurement is great, but isn't the point of it to have some shared learning about what it means. In collective impact, shared measurement means having a system for collecting data together and then measuring and sharing some common results, which usually involves selecting a short list of results to measure. And that certainly helps focus our actions and build shared accountability. But the 3.0 version says that these shared measures are part of a larger system of learning and evaluation that can drive continuous improvement. And in terms of mutually reinforcing activities, the 3.0 version is high leverage activities. So, Again, mutually reinforcing activities are an excellent thing to aim for as opposed to, for example, duplicating services or working at cross purposes. But wouldn't it even be better to have these mutually reinforcing activities offer as much leverage as possible to create changes in underlying conditions? In collective impact, a diverse set of stakeholders, typically across sectors, coordinates a set of differentiated activities through some kind of joint action plan. But in 3.0, we go beyond cooperation and coordination to identify knowledge, networks, relationships, and other opportunities to truly create systems change. And the continuous communication key ingredient also got an upgrade into authentic community engagement. And this really benefits from a more specific description of why you invest in communicating in the first place, which is to have a stronger, more authentic and inclusive engagement from lots of different community members. Um, in collective impact, all players engage in frequent and structured open communication with the goal of building trust, assuring that mutual objectives are reached and creating some common motivation but Collective Impact 3.0 really goes beyond that to talk about co-design with community members who are most impacted by the social problem being addressed. And this is one of the areas where the original Collective Impact authors really felt that they had fallen short when they re-looked at their model. So this 3.0 really captures that as an improvement. And then in terms of a strong backbone, um, the, the 3.0 version talks about containers for change. And strong backbones to support this work, as I mentioned earlier, can take so many different forms, but can be we can be even more creative if we think about something like containers for change. Somebody still has to hold the responsibility for convening, for harvesting what's being learned, 
for reaching out, reaching in, but it can really look different at different times in the process or depending on the initiative. And so in the original collective impact, this was thought of as some sort of independent, dedicated set of staff or consultants, and they could be from one or more agencies to guide the initiative's vision and strategy, to support aligned activities and establish shared measurement practices to cultivate that kind of community engagement and ownership and advance the policies and the resources required to enact them. In the 3.0 version, a strong container, and I'll quote from the, the literature on this, is a place where the collective impact partners can transform their understandings of the system they're trying to change, the relationships with others in the systems, and their intentions to act. The boundaries of this container are set so that the participants feel enough protection and safety, as well as enough pressure and friction to be able to do their challenging work. So again, that's from the Temerac upgrade of this, the 3.0 version, but it really captures that balance of trying to hold accountability, but also create a place where there's trust and movement um, among partners who may not always work together. So any, any clarifying questions? But for those of you that in the poll said that you were unfamiliar with collective impact, was there anything that you saw or heard and what Nicole just covered that raises more questions for you or leaves you wondering what does that actually mean? Are people, are people familiar with that 3.0 version from the Tamarack Institute or, or more the original version? Just curious. Yeah, I had not heard of the 3.0 version, so it's really good information. I like the direction that it's going in. Thanks, Julie. Yeah, I, we felt that way too, that it had some, um, it just, it, it, it's been out for a few years, but it just, it reflects a lot of good thinking from just different people with more experience with this. And it, it kind of reflects that idea that when you're um, in a learning stance about what's been accomplished and where it's fallen short, that the, the original authors of the study have been very open to critiques and um, comments about where it's fallen short and where it does and doesn't work for people. And so that's kind of encouraging to see that they've been they've been working together with with some of the um, the users of this model to really try and refine it and adapt it to changing conditions. And and after all, a lot happens in a decade. So um, that's been good. Yeah. To see. And and I would say I'm in I'm in one collaborative that I feel like is in line with this, and I'm curious now to go back and happens to be United Way led. I'm curious yeah. if this is a model that they are familiar with and conscientiously using, intentionally using, uh -huh. or you know, for that particular group, or if it's just evolved in that way because it is very similar to, to this. Yeah, and that's actually a question we're going to pose to you in just a moment about um, a lot of the original work was trying to capture what initiatives had in common that had had that organic evolution that you're describing, where they kind of arrived at some of these ingredients um, for their own reasons um, that, that the collective impact authors, the Stanford Social Innovation Review authors, were really describing and documenting something that already exists where they were trying to match what characteristics these initiatives had in common when they were effective. And so it's, it's not as if somebody figured this out and then other people went out and did it. They were really describing something that was already working on the ground in different communities. So it makes sense that others would have arrived in, in their own routes and paths to this without necessarily calling it this. Mm -hmm. Nicole, do you see uh, there's a couple of questions in the chat. Um, 
Cindy is asking, would there be visions of multiple or single backbone in Santa Cruz with regard to the core initiative? Meaning the backbone is the county and city or backbones, multiple backbones in the community. So I'm just catching up to the chat, sorry. Yeah. And maybe I can do a first pass at, at yeah, go ahead. Addressing that and then see if see if you have another way of thinking about that or anything else to add to that, Nicole. You know, I think with um, you know, collective impact in general, I think that's also been one of the, as Nicole said, one of the kind of evolving ways of thinking that it doesn't have to be a singular backbone. That oftentimes it's, you know, really looking at different partners that have different skill sets and resources and <laughs> positions and relationships in the community and really figuring out what is the best um, kind of fit or way to really draw on and maximize those roles. You know, in terms of core investments as a collective impact approach, um, in many ways right now, Nicole and I serve as that backbone, really trying to help keep the communication going and bringing people together, you know, at the, at the necessary times and opportunities. Um, but there are also, I think, uh, many other ways that we try to uh, engage and involve other leaders and partners so that it's not solely dependent on, you know, two individuals or <laughs> one organization. And so I think certainly that's another area, too, where we could um, definitely see some, you know, evolution over time with core investments itself. And so that's a, you know, good question to be thinking about. Um, for, you know, about any of the other collaboratives or collective impact types of groups or initiatives that you're all involved in to think about, okay, who, who does play that backbone role and does it, you know, is it best suited for one organization? Is it best suited for, you know, multiple organizations to share that role? So I hope that, I hope that answers your question, Cindy. And Nicole, is there anything you want to add to that? Whoops, muted. No, I think you covered it. Thanks, Nicole. And I'm seeing in the chat too, just the, um, the challenges in getting the community involved and not just the agencies to do the work. Absolutely. Um, but are there best practices for how to engage individuals from the community? Definitely, I think a lot of you have the experience of the, the support, the, um, the ways that people can be um, brought into situations, whether it's a board or an advisory board or to um, give feedback that are um, not putting people in a situation that's, that's strained or um, difficult for them, but where the they feel that their input is valued and that it's easy to give their input and that, that their input um, influences decisions and the, and the results of their input gets back to them. So if there are people who, who on this call who wanna talk about their experiences with bringing in the community experience to their own, either the situations that Jade is describing in the chat or others. And Ray, I see your comment about shared measurements, um, shared outcome measurements to see an impact, which is sometimes the hardest. Absolutely, these are these are not easy things to accomplish, um, and so that's part of the challenge. Is why that you need time and an investment, a commitment from multiple partners to make some of these things happen because they're not surface um, garden variety sorts of things. I just posted a link in the chat to Live Oak Cradle to Careers playbook for community oh, engagement. Idea. It's something that is relatively new and they're continuing to refine it, but um, it's in response to Jade's question about best practices um, that, you know, I think what 
I know what I hear other partners talking about more and more is just, you know, how, you know, it's so dependent on the relationship building and the trust building. And oftentimes that can, you know, take a while or it takes that, you know, continued commitment to invest the time and the resources to build those relationships, to be able to support um, the kind of progression of involvement and leadership among community members so that, you know, it may result in someone joining a board of directors or a community advisory group. It may take some other form in terms of leadership and advocacy. Um, but oftentimes it's, you know, it takes that kind of looking at what is the um, support and opportunities and relationship building that happens even before that, you know, invitation or uh, acceptance to join a board or an advisory group. The Cradle to Career playbook has some great, I think, uh, great ways of describing that. Thanks, Nicole. If anybody else has resources like that to share or ideas, please feel free to do so in the chat. So Julie mentioned um, something she's involved in that may or may not be called collective impact, but has some of these characteristics. So I'm wondering if in the chat, based on what you've just learned about what collective impact is and is not, how many of you think that you're part of collaborative efforts that have at least one of the features of, um, of collective impact? and just maybe put in the chat, which one? So which, which um, key condition? So are you involved with something that has a shared vision or purpose? Are you with other partners? Are you involved with something that has some kind of, um, mutually reinforcing activities with others? Are you involved in something that has shared measurement? Um, something that has a, a backbone function, keeping people humming along? You want me to answer that? Sure, go ahead, Alexander. Um, yeah, Second Harvest Food Bank works with a lot of different partners in the county to actually distribute the food. So I would say that the mission of easing hunger is like a very strong mission and it's mm -hmm. relies on a lot of different organizations working together. I think uh, the collective impact model is really interesting and uh, I talk to Second Harvest more about that. Mm -hmm. So you have multiple partners working together in some way on a shared vision and some things go along with that, the communication pieces perhaps, and just tracking some things together. Yeah, definitely. Okay. Anybody else? How many of you feel you're doing multiple key ingredients at once? So Adult Protective Services, Stephen is saying that he sees his agency using shared vision and containers for change. Thanks. And Helen, thanks for the focus group suggestion. I see that in the chat as well. Um, and so Julie, United for Youth, the shared safety work group is the initiative you were thinking of. And those are actually two different, two different, two different collaboratives that I feel are both doing collective impact work. Okay, great. And so those of you who see collective impact reflected in your work, do you see that that's something that evolved kind of naturally over time as Julie described, or something that's more deliberate where somebody identified this as an approach or a model and you're working more intentionally and systematically towards these elements. And if, if you've tried some of these 
elements and and things have gotten in your way what are some of the challenges or barriers you've experienced ray you mentioned how hard it is to have shared measurement of outcomes for example any other barriers or specific barriers or challenges you want to share with the group I think a, a barrier is bandwidth of leadership. You know, when you're trying to bring several organizations together to do something, it's so, when I think of these two that I listed in the chat, there, there's strong leadership, there's a strong facilitation. Um, and I think without that, it's very difficult for different organizations to come together <laughs> Um, yeah. without one, I mean, that backbone organization is so important, but not only a backbone organization, but somebody who has been identified to facilitate the movement and keep people, keep it moving forward. Without that, I just, I haven't seen things be successful. So I guess the barrier is not having that one person who has the time and resources to be that leading force. Yeah, that's so true, Julie. And you'll see in a minute, we're going to talk about some of the ways that people identify their readiness for this work and having some kind of champion is absolutely on that list. Champion champions. Um, so I'm seeing some more comments coming in in the chat about Jade is saying um, this may start organically and then build with, with grants and support um, as time goes on. Absolutely. Um, Sally is saying there are no community to find outcomes for the arts that you're aware of, where to start with those. Um, and then having the bandwidth to match the interests of similar issues to what Julie's described. Um, a lot of work intentional, but not necessarily based on this model. Absolutely. There's some elements of this model in lots of other places. Um, having the resources to make an impact. As Ray's mentioning, sometimes the funding and the goal are disconnected. That's very true as well. So are there areas locally where you think this approach could yield a greater impact working collectively in this way? Some of you have mentioned things you're already doing. Are there other areas where this has not been applied and could be that come to mind? And I think um, to lesser or greater extent, a lot of this could be applied like all over the place, definitely with Second Harvest and with the Blue Circle, I think in general, just the philosophy of working together towards these common goals and realizing that you can have a greater effect when you're working together and, and putting effort in a sort of a more systematic way, like this is defining, I think, could have really good results. Mm -hmm. Yep, thanks, Alexander. And that's, that's exactly where this came from. It's just when a kind of routine collaboration or, or coordination um, isn't yielding the results that you think it should or could, then what are the ways to augment that effort? All right, let's, sorry, go ahead, Nicole. I was gonna say that, you know, I think um, just from some of the other groups and initiatives that I'm part of and, and work on, I think there's element, a lot of those have elements of collective impact and, and either just don't name it that. And so sometimes even just, you know, uh, starting to use that language, right? So as part of building that shared understanding um, can help, you know, um, see where there might be areas to strengthen, uh, like, things like shared measurement, because uh, oftentimes that's one of the pieces that is missing, right? Because it's so hard to do. And like, how do you reach agreement on what those, you know, prioritized outcomes, those shared outcomes would be? And can everyone agree to use the same tools to measure those outcomes? Like those can be hard discussions, especially if, 
you know, everyone's used to doing things their own ways. They might still be collaborating, but still doing things and measuring things in their own ways. Collective impact is really then, um, you know, elevating that conversation around how do we really show our collective impact by measuring things in a same in the same way. Um, it, de it definitely takes resources to do that, and so it's hard to do hard to do that if you you know don't have uh, adequate resources. Definitely takes facilitation, like Julie was saying, someone that can help guide that conversation so that there is, you know, a true agreement. And sometimes, again, and you know, thinking about Sally's question about where to where to begin, sometimes even just introducing language like this or frameworks like this can get that that conversation started. Um, and then you bring those. You start with who you think might be interested in having that conversation with you, and. Uh, if they if there's a shared interest in exploring it further and really kind of using and and I think some of the things that Nicole will go over next will can help with those kind of starter conversations about, you know, is collective impact the right approach? You know, do we have the right people uh, at the table to be part of this conversation from the beginning? You know, where could this take us? You know, really just starting with those kinds of questions can be a great way to get started. What perfect yeah. seg. And Lisa, I see Lisa's comment in the chat about also exploring how competition plays a role in the process. I think it's a really important thing to name and to be able to work through. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think in the in the collective impact literature, both the original study and the updates since then, competition has been an initial barrier, but not necessarily a, um, a predictor of success or not. It's, pr it's pretty interesting how people have worked through some of that. Um, let's get into some of the things that Nicole mentioned about when collective impact is appropriate and how to determine whether or not a community is, or a, a, a set of partners is ready for it. So clearly collective impact is not a match for every problem or situation. Um, so when there's a, um, a flawed or broken system that includes silos, people not working together, outdated policies that, um, that contribute to a problem or create new barriers, when there's very little innovation because the solutions don't address the true nature of the problem, or the system actors aren't empowered to take risks to design solutions and evaluation or learning isn't prioritized. Um, those things get in the way of a, a collective impact approach. But when you have a group of partners that's really committed to making some kind of measurable impact and they come from multiple sectors, so that those can either be the sectors that are um, like a public sector, private sector, nonprofit sector, or other collections of, of like uh, of affinities of effort, education, health, et cetera. Um, so something that crosses the, the silos that would otherwise keep these efforts separate can be a real indicator that something's um, appropriate for a collective impact approach. And as I mentioned, when we have so many systems that are at at best flawed and at worst truly broken or cementing some of the problems that we see and the inequities that we see, that's another place where the pressure from multiple sectors and partners and committed partners can really address some of those systemic structural issues as well. And then again, the, the idea of working across these silos um, finding common purpose across organizations, even if they compete in other realms, and coming up with solutions that are outside the usual set of solutions that might um, be brought to bear on particular problems. Those are all indicators that collective impact is an appropriate approach. And then there are a number of resources on some of the sites we'll share with you in a bit. Um, from the Tamarack Institute and others that help you assess whether or not your effort is ready for collective impact. And these even um, take the, the, 
the point of view of uh, like a flow chart or, you know, if this is true for you, then this might be the approach to take or you may or may not be ready. So even if a problem lends itself to collective impact, a community or a group of partners may not be as ready. So in general, collective impact approaches have yielded results when there's a strong sense of urgency for change, and that ch urgency is commonly understood. When there's a history of collaboration and its most important byproduct of trust, when there are local leaders and the champions that Julie described that you need to keep things moving, especially when efforts encounter obstacles or flag for other reasons, and that there are resources devoted to the collaboration itself so it can be sustained. So some questions to consider, and these are courtesy of the FSG Collective Impact Forum, which is another great resource we'll share with you. Um, the readiness assessments that they provide include these types of questions to ask yourselves about whether or not a collective impact approach is truly worth the considerable effort that it takes. So first, of course, is defining the problem or issue and then asking yourself, does it really require cross-sector work or is it something that could be done within a sector or a group of organizations? Is our system truly broken? Um, so again, the, are there silos and outdated policies, a lack of innovation and equity? And then are we ready? Is there a sense of that urgency? Do we have champions in place? Do we have enough trust among the people who need to be involved in this? And do we have some resources to devote to this? So those are some ways to think about if you have the luxury of trying to figure out before you launch a collective impact approach, whether you're ready to invest in that. But if you're if you've kind of um, moved into something that feels and looks like collective impact organically and on your own, these are still good questions to ask for sustaining an effort. So any questions about this, about when collective impact is appropriate or how to tell whether you're ready for it? All right, let me turn it back over to Nicole and see if you have some other questions. Yeah, because we, you know, we hope that this either affirmed what you already knew about collective impacts, maybe added to what you knew. And for those of you, again, that started off saying that you uh, were not familiar at all or knew very little, that this gives you um, a good kind of foundation of knowledge about what we mean when we say a collective impact approach. Um, so we just wanted to check, some of you have been asking some great questions or making comments in the chat all along. Just wanted to see if, you know, based on what you've heard us share today, you know, what kinds of questions come up for you about, or for each other, about collective impact? Good morning, this is Stephen with Advocacy Inc. Hi. Go ahead. Hi. So this is really all new to me, I, uh, relatively new in my role here uh, as the long-term care ombudsman program coordinator. But our work is very specific to working within um, long-term care facilities like skilled nursing, assisted living, and then our patient right advocates work within mental health facilities. And so I'm struggling, I guess, a little bit, and I don't know if this is more of a question or just a comment on how collective impact could benefit those very specific programs in that, you know, typically outside partners, uh, be them nonprofit or for-profit, uh, don't work within long-term care facilities. So we, I guess it feels like we're sort of isolated. Um, and certainly uh, in my time here, and historically there's been broken systems like uh, California public, public excuse me, California Department of Public Health, the community care licensing is not as perhaps attentive to the concerns we're seeing. So again, I'm just struggling to see where this, how this could potentially be a benefit to our pretty much siloed agency, if that makes any sense. And maybe you can offer some thoughts or insight or even 
let's get back to you. Maybe this is a bigger conversation. It's a great question. Do you want to, I see you unmuted, Nicole. Do you want to say something first? Yeah, I'm just curious, Stephen, about if you had a chance to break out of that silo that you feel that you're in, which direction would you go in? Are there are there other sectors or um, types of agencies that you think should be interested in what's going on in assisted living and long-term care facilities who are kind of sitting on the sidelines and may not realize their connection to the issues that you you and your constituents are facing? That's a that's a great question as well. Um, you know, I, I think what was coming to my mind, um, and I had mentioned in the chat about our collaborative, somewhat collaborative approach with Adult Protective Services, um, but they don't do anything within the facility itself. So if there's an issue and the, say, for example, a resident in a skilled nursing wants to transition to home, I'm finding this gap where who is it to help them transition from one place to another or what if they're in their home and they need to live long-term care? Who's going to help them navigate if they don't have family support or, or local connections? Um, and I am finding, or I have, I have been challenged to find that community partner that can help in either of those scenarios. And those are two, in my experience, bigger issues. Um, mm -hmm. <laughs> so again, I'm probably coming with more questions and answers to that. that. That's fine. You know, I, this is, that's what this is for, to, to raise questions, to challenge each other, and to think about these things um, and kind of struggle through it together, because you're, you're not alone, I'm sure, in, in wondering how this applies to what you're doing, and it may or may not. Um, but even more broadly, and Stephen, I'm saying this just from some other work I'm doing, I, you know, I think um, one of the things with people who are in any kind of institutionalized setting like assisted living or no matter how well designed it is, is that feeling of isolation from the wider world that you've described, you know, that, that people don't have community support necessarily. They may be separated from the, the family and networks that could help them. Um, so, you know, there, there are ways to think about some of the, um, for example, the, the, um, the connection to the people who are working on on broadband and asking, you know, for ways that people can do telehealth and other kinds of um, social connection through, um, you know, I'm, I'm aware of some initiatives that are doing that, and there's been some work locally to have things like tablets for and and peer coaching for people who may not be familiar with technology at all and have that opportunity to see a grandchild who's far away or. Um, or have somebody read a book to them or, or that sort of thing. And so make, that's a whole world, the, the, the tech, assistive technology world and the broadband access world are places that have um, a connection to this work that they may or may not see and may be beneficial to some of the people you're working with. Alexander, I see your hand up. Alexander, you're on mute, sorry. Okay, sorry. Yeah. I'm glad somebody besides me is doing that. <laughs> <laughs> what what Thank you, you for that. Uh, reminded me in, uh, about some programs that I've heard about that are somewhat in the same vein of the conversation, I think, where um, like elderly care facilities were teaming up with um, like daycares or like uh, animal mm -hmm. shelters and and trying to tackle some of the uh, loneliness issues mm -hmm. that they've seen. Um, and I thought that that was sort of an interesting example of sort of cross-sector collaboration. Yeah, that's true. I, I, I've seen some things about um, even like co-housing of, of mm -hmm. seniors and families with young children to have that, that connection. So, so you can see just from a little bit of this discussion that part of it is um, thinking about what's possible um, in kind of an ideal way and then getting away from the, well, this is the way the, the world is structured now or funded now um, and what, what might be something to explore or discover about a different way to do what we're doing. 
And that takes energy and time and resources as well. So it's not, that's not always available as, as an option, you know, a realistic option for what you're doing, but that's part of what the push of collective impact is to think about um, those, those different solutions or things that haven't been tried with partners who have not been at the table, as well as the ones who already are. Nicole, do you have anything to add to Stephen's question or? Yeah, you know, a couple things. One is that, um, uh, speaking to some of the things that Nicole covered just a while ago, that not every program or not every agency has to be a collective impact initiative or collective impact approach, but your program or agency might be part of a broader um, collection of agencies and systems, right, where a collective impact approach would be beneficial. And in some ways, it's as much of a mindset as it is a way of, you know, doing things. And so it just struck me to, you know, hearing you say, Stephen, that, you know, there are definitely, there's a definitely a broken system, right, that, that, uh, <laughs> that your agency exists within. And so again, it's kind of, you know, are there others that see that as well? And maybe even it's, you know, in earlier um, points in that system where, you know, as adults age, you know, that, that there may be similar or kind of um, related, you know, barriers or challenges that older adults experience that uh, are part of, again, the kinds of um, gaps and challenges and, and symptoms of the broken system that you see, right, once people are in assisted living uh, facilities and is there a conversation or, you know, shared visioning and, and um, you know, discussions around shared measurements that could be beneficial to have with those kinds of partners thinking about kind of the spectrum of programs and policies and practices that either could help, you know, fix or change that broken system or, um, again, might lead to some of those new and creative ideas that like Nicole was mentioning. Thank you both. I appreciate the opportunity to just, you know, again, this is a lot of this is really new. Um, and I think other community partners that are part of this, uh, this meeting can probably acknowledge the, you know, really limited resources, you know, the person power, you know, when you've got a team of three trying to work within 38 facilities in the County of Santa Cruz and San Benito, that becomes problematic. Um, and then with this RFP process coming up, that adds another element of concern and, and nervousness and, you know, will we get what we need? We don't have enough now, you know, that those kind of questions. Um, so I know, I mean, I, I'm not the ED over here, um, but I am certain that our agency would be happy to, to have conversation with other community partners in regard to how we can better support our old adults living long-term care in long-term care facilities in a system that is oftentimes set against them for successful outcomes. Um, so I just appreciate the opportunity to, to share what little bit I've learned in the last five months being in this role. Um, and uh, again, always open to more conversation on how we better support our community's residents, regardless of their age. Great, thanks for that, Stephen, and thanks for asking that question. Gave us a good, good little discussion there. Are there any other questions that are coming to mind about collective impact, what this might mean? Alexander, do you have another question? Yeah, sorry. Um, I'm not sure if this was stated, but I, I just wanted to point out in case anyone was hadn't seen it, but the uh, the link that and Nicole Young posted is really cool, uh, really interesting stuff about specifically using um, collective impact and aid friendly communities. And it seems like people have done a lot of work already in that and a lot of good information. Yeah. Great. Thanks for that, Alexander. What about, um, Nicole, do you want to go to the next slide? heard some of you share some of your thoughts in reaction to hearing about collective impact or learning more or kind of learning more about the nuances. Anyone else want to share thoughts about what you find exciting or intriguing about this collective impact approach? 
Any, any insights or aha moments that came to mind as you were hearing the information? I'll just add on that again. <laughs> In regard to the what's exciting or intriguing, you know, I I would absolutely, as I had mentioned previously, would be awesome to see how outside facility community partners can help, you know, support, I think, shouldering the weight of um, the challenges our community faces in a social aspect, I think helps us spread our resources a little bit more effectively. You know, it seems like, you know, we're in a pandemic still, you know, and I know a lot of this stuff is catching up from reopenings and and all of that. And I'm certain that the other partners on this on this call are experiencing that likely increase in volume uh, of need within our community. So that's what's exciting to me, you know, seeing how we might be able to partner with others and, and subsequently how others might be able to partner with us to have the most effective and resource, um, or best allocation of resources, not just financially, but the, the people power, the, the hearts behind the work, if you will, uh, to just do better. You know, just try to do a little better. Yeah, I love that. And it's very consistent with the way that we think about the one of those core conditions is lifelong learning and education and like just that constant, like how do we how do we do better? How do we know what's going well? How do we know what still needs some work? How can we continuously improve as part of that? you know, lifelong learning mindset, which is very much a part of collective impact as well. It's that piece around uh, not just collecting data for data's sake, but really collecting data for strategic learning and about how, you know, are, are we really collectively creating the kind of impact, lasting impact um, that we know is needed. And again, you know, um, in many ways, you know, we, I think it helps, I find it helpful to think of collective impact as, um, again, a, a mindset, a way of doing things. It might feel slightly out of reach, right? The, <laughs> you might not feel like, okay, like I'm ready to lead or my organization is ready to lead a collective impact approach. Um, you know, that may feel unrealistic, but just being able to ask these, you know, identify who might other interested partners be you know, how do we open up a conversation? How do we keep asking these kinds of questions of each other? Like that's the beginnings of a collective impact approach that are, you know, um, very worth, worthwhile as well. Yeah, Lisa, did you wanna add something? Hi, good morning. Yeah, I have two things. Um, first of all, I think one of the challenges in, in some of the collaboration pieces um, are getting the people to the table. And I'm an early care and education administer, administrator for Community Bridges, and we have six programs across the county. And sometimes right now we're working on an inclusion uh, early education expansion grant. And so it's really all of us in early education are at the table. Um, when we try to reach to, you know, special ed or, you know, psychologists, mental health support people, it's really much harder to get um, cross-sector groups, even though we're all in the early education sector, to the table. And so that's sometimes challenging. And um, a couple a couple things stood out just from one of one of the community chats that where we were talking about anti-racism um the one of the big takeaways for me was doing one small thing and so i think in this piece there's sometimes just one small thing can make a really big difference and what really resonated with me today is the community aspirations with my team specifically um, in the leadership group, we meet we meet weekly, and we incorporate a reflective practice to see where we've been, and we've been working on quality improvements in many ways in the agency and in our program over many many years. Um, but I've always had you know what to call the the piece. Is it visioning? Is it you know we've named it lots of things, but now for me that aspirations rings true, and also in our management team, which includes all of the programs across the agency, we have a placeholder on the agenda for something that sort of looks collaborative, and this is kind of what I'm talking about, right? Where there's a community voice or community voices involved in those aspirations and and doing small things collectively. Love that, Lisa. I'm a big believer too, and in, in that 
concept of small things add up, right? So can't underestimate the power of those of those small things. And sometimes it's most important just to get started and do something, right? And then you build your momentum and find your way um, versus waiting until the path is perfectly clear <laughs> and all the resources are in place because that will most likely never happen. Right, so thanks for sharing that. Anyone else want to share anything that you found particularly interesting, exciting, or intriguing to you about this collective impact approach and either how it's currently being used in different efforts and initiatives you're involved in or, or the potential for it to be used more? Anybody have any other questions that are on your mind or or concerns that are coming up? Like this all sounds great, but uh, I have some questions. Sure. Who? Uh... Alex. Alex. Yes. Go ahead. Um, I'm curious. Is the core coffee chat a nonprofit, or or what's what? How does the organization actually work? I know there's regular meetings, but aside from that, what what's like the function and organization of it? Good question. So core, so the work that Nicole and I do in convening these coffee chats and other learning opportunities that we put under the umbrella of the Core Institute, um, we, we do that as consultants to the County of Santa Cruz in the city of Santa Cruz as a way to support kind of the broader countywide core investments effort. And so um, it's core started off as purely a funding model, a way for the county and city of Santa Cruz to um, provide resources and funding to nonprofits that are providing safety net services. They uh, did the first round of core funding five years ago, and they're getting ready to issue the next request for proposals. Um, we should hear about that. Actually, there's a board meeting tomorrow and a city council meeting tomorrow where they will um, review and hopefully adopt and, and approve the release of the RFP. And so stay tuned for that because that's something that probably many of you will be interested in taking a look at and considering applying for. Um, and so core Investments itself is not an organization. The Core Coffee Chats, the Core Institute itself is not like a standalone nonprofit organization. It's really just kind of an organized effort mm -hmm. that Nicole and I lead at this point to really try to support that shared and ongoing learning as a way to um, contribute to a you know collective impact at its broadest sense you know, in terms of building shared knowledge and shared skills and sharing resources like this uh, that could help other organizations and other uh, other efforts. Awesome. And then um, I just had another question about um, our sort of collective impact inspired partnerships between organizations um, facilitated by Core Coffee Chat or is it more informational and then up to organizations to reach out and try to use what they learn together if that makes sense it does it's more of the latter where we're trying to provide um the kinds of resources learning opportunities to again uh you know build that shared knowledge and help people connect to each other and to ideas but the actual kind of organized collective impact efforts and initiatives really exist and live within uh, other organizations in the community, like some of the ones that were mentioned today, like United for Youth, um, you know, some of Second Harvest's work. So it's the organizations, you know, they kind of figure out how they want to use frameworks like this. Um, and then through the coffee chest, we try to provide additional tools and resources um, for organizations that are wanting to figure out, okay, how exactly do we do this? How do we use these tools? How do we get through some of these, you know, potential challenges or hurdles? Um, but we're not necessarily the ones out there like leading the, you know, facilitating those collective impact collaborative meetings. Awesome, thank you. Okay. 
Okay, good questions here. See some chats about very exciting to learn about these types of approaches. Appreciating the information. Great, glad you find that helpful. I guess we're curious too, when you think, some of you already mentioned this, but when you again think about these five elements of collective impact and how they uh, have evolved themselves into Collective Impact 3.0, uh, what are some other examples of initiatives where you, or are there any examples of initiatives where you feel like, oh yeah, I, I see, see uh, evidence of all five of those components or elements of collective impact in those initiatives? the common agenda and community aspiration, the shared measurement for strategic learning, the continuous communication and, and community engagement, the backbone and the, as the container for change. And I know I'm missing that fifth one, <laughs> the mutually reinforcing activities and high leverage activities. Does anyone feel like you are part of or you know of collaborative or initiative that has all five of those in place and really strong. Donna, or is it Donna, says United Way's Youth, for Youth Action Network has all five. Anyone else have examples? Yeah, again, I really feel like the shared safety network, the only one that we're really struggling on is the shared measurement. In fact, we we tried to get shared measurement and then there was a lot of barriers to that um, in terms of what we found was that even though we are all working on um, bringing trauma-informed services to survivors of crime, um, we're measuring it in different ways based on our who's funding us <laughs> you know like I, we have to fill out these three reports and you have to fill out those three reports but they're not asking for the exact same um, data points and so that was a barrier and then just not wanting to add yet another report onto people's plates when they're overwhelmed with all the reports they're already fulfilling so um, it's 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 an interesting uh, barrier and now that Santa Cruz has data share you know there's some hope um, that we can get there so there's a, a vision and a <laughs> um, and, and a way to share that data and I and I think the hard part is getting from here to there in terms of identifying just simple data points that we can all um, feed into but I think that um, it, it, it hits all those other uh, four points very well. Yeah, and you, you know, touched on a really, uh, I think, important point there, Julia, sometimes even when there's the intent, right, and the shared interest in a pure and complete collective impact approach, that there's still other factors, right, that <laughs> like, you, you know, where your funding's coming from or other requirements that can definitely make that a challenging um process right and so that's part of um part of working together in a collective imp impact type of way to see you know what what are some of those workarounds and and so in some cases it might mean agreeing to do something additional so that you have that shared measurement other times it might lead to a different you know creative solution that maybe no one had thought of before and so even just having the conversation uh, and continuing or returning to the conversation can be really important. I like that you mentioned too, uh, the availability of data share at Santa Cruz County. Um, we'll definitely be doing some other trainings and TA sessions after the request for proposals is released about how to use data share, which is a uh, web-based data platform where there's all kinds of like community level data that uh, is often a, key part of the shared measurement system. It's not the only thing, right, that you have to look at, but it can give that sense of, okay, across a community, you know, how do things look in different areas of health and well-being? And then, you know, the at a program level, what outcomes or data 
uh, are related or relevant or can and should be measured in the same or similar way. So we'll, we'll uh, definitely make sure more information about data share is available also. Okay, any other final thoughts, questions, insights that came up for you today? Well, why don't we show our final slide to tell you what's coming up. We're so glad uh, that all of you came today, that we had some great discussion. Thank you everyone for asking your questions, sharing your insights. Um, there are a few resources here and Gisela I think has the links and we'll put them in the chat as well. We'll also include these in the follow-up email that we'll send out in a few days that has the links to the recordings and uh, some of these resources here. So we definitely encourage you to learn more. Also, uh, just know that there's a lot of resources in these, so uh, don't get too overwhelmed when you see the wealth of <laughs> uh, information resources available. Um, and if there are particular things that you're interested in, if you're exploring either any of these resources and you want to hear more about them or you want to suggest a coffee chat on a particular aspect of collective impact in the future, feel free to, to let us know and we'll try to work something into our, into our calendar. And then speaking of calendar, coming up, we have a few things that we want you to be aware of. So again, tomorrow, if you're interested in just um, hearing more about the core request for proposals, um, you know, what that process will look like from the point it's released to when it's due and how award decisions will be made. Um, there's a presentation to both the Board of Supervisors tomorrow morning and the Santa Cruz City Council tomorrow afternoon. I think theirs is around 4.45, they're thinking, um, because that's the point when the request for proposals itself will be presented to them so that they can you know, give feedback, if any, and then approve it so that it can be released the following Tuesday is the goal. So Tuesday, November 16th is when it will officially be released and that opens up the formal application period. Uh, the draft of the RFP is available on the County Board of Supervisors website as well as the City of Santa Cruz if you wanna look at it before those meetings. And if you feel inclined to speak up during public comment, you are welcome to do that. Um, and then we're going to continue offering, again, different uh, learning opportunities, trainings, uh, technical assistance, really geared towards helping people feel ready to um, prepare and submit their applications for CORE. Um, and so next week, we will do a CORE coffee chat, really focusing on understanding what the CORE conditions for health and well-being are, like how we define them as part of core, um, because that will be, you know, that could be another helpful tool, right, as you're thinking about or preparing your applications. Um, the, for anyone that is thinking about applying for core funding, the Human Services Department for the county will be hosting an applicants conference on December 1st from 2 to 4 p.m. Nicole and I will be providing just the kind of technical Zoom support for that. Um, but it'll be HSD that's leading it. So that's a time when, you know, encourage you to look at the RFP when it, when it comes out, come with your questions, um, and, uh, and you'll hear more about kind of the ongoing opportunities to submit questions about the RFP and, and have those answered. And then new, uh, the county and city are using an online portal this year for this funding cycle called Reviewer. And that is not a typo, it does not have an E between the W and the R. <laughs> uh, so the platform itself is called Reviewer. Um, there will be a couple trainings offered on how to use that platform. The first one will be held on Friday, December 3rd. Again, HSD is going to uh, do that training. Nicole and I will just provide kind of the techni technical, technological Zoom support for that. Um, so registration information will, will be coming soon for those as well as Nicole and I are gonna have a whole schedule of um, trainings and group office hours and opportunities to sign up for individualized technical assistance, basically from uh, December through uh, like February 3rd, the day before the applications are due. So we'll send, we'll 
keep an eye out for more information about how to sign up for all of those uh, in the very near future. I believe that is it for today. And so before you go, we would love it if you uh, fill out another poll, giving us some feedback about today's session. And then once you leave this meeting, once you finish the poll, you're welcome to leave the meeting. Once you leave the meeting, you will see another uh, opportunity, a short survey appear on your web browser, um, asking you a few open-ended questions. Uh, it's another opportunity to give feedback. But we will keep this poll open and uh, we'll stay on for a few more minutes in case anybody has some lingering questions or comments. Um, but again, if those of you who have done the poll or you're ready to leave need to sign off, we so thank you looks, for being here and we'll see you in the future. 